Hello Amiga coders, this is Photon and I'm continuing my ASM School series. The last tutorial we showed you how to put a logo on the screen and we made some other changes to make it a little more like a demo with some sort of layout. And um, if you load the tutorial and run it, it looks like this. Um, and you have the moving copper bar behind the logo and um, some semi-random data filling a bitmap buffer. Well, as you can see, I've solved the um, problem that we had in the previous tutorial that we had some crap under the under the logo. And let's have a look at that. It's removed because Essentially, the memory below the logo, or I should say address-wise, it's, it's higher up than the logo, it's after the logo in memory, is cleared. So all the pixels have color zero, and uh, that's why there's no crap under the logo, between the, the logo and the semi-random data. So let's have a look at that. I have no idea what the labels are called anymore. Um, maybe we should do a run-through first of the source. Here's our source and um, I have used the very old-school way of, of um, assuming that all the memory from hex 20,000 up to almost the full chipmem size is available for me to use. And this is the case if, if you have a normal Amiga and uh, you don't load Workbench first, then um, you may use a lot of chipmem for screen buffers and other buffers. Um, shall we shall we do a cleanup before I explain why the um, how I got rid of the how to get rid of the crap below the logo? Let's do that. Let me let's make this a little more system friendly um, because I've had some requests. Uh, I may choose to revert to this way of doing it if I need to cho show you uh, some um, external file loading commands. But let's do this. From top to bottom, let's go through the source and clean it up a little bit. So we'll make a section instead and we'll call it um, something like that. It needs to be short. and. Uh, we tell it what data type, what type of memory chunk this is, or memory section, and um, this is a code hunk. These are called hunks, and we need to specify whether it goes into fast memory or chip memory. And um, let's go ahead and um, change that to fast memory. What happens then is that it will assume that the machine has fast memory and try to load it into fast memory and if the machine does not have fast memory it will fail to load uh, that hunk and tell you so. Uh, which is not good. So we'll just remove that and say that it, this code can go in any memory. Then the system will first try to put it in fast memory if available. If enough of it is available, and um, failing that, it will put it in any other type of memory available, including chipman. So that's good for the code. Code can be in either chip memory or fast memory. Um, not so good for stuff that needs to be accessed by the custom chips, such as copper lists, sprites, etc., etc. We have taken the precaution of putting, uh, or graphics, like this logo, we've taken the precaution of putting these last in the in the source so that we can simply put them in another section. Now the reason I remove the even statement there is because this this byte is the last byte in the previous section and this section is completely unrelated so that uh, we don't need to worry about that this address is even because all the hunks, I believe, will be loaded, be loaded to a um, an address uh, divisible by four, or perhaps even eight in in uh, AGA machines. 
and uh, later kickstarts. Either way, uh, this is not code, this is data. As far as the assembler is concerned, we know it's graphics and a copper list, but, but there are only a few types of, of memory hunks. Uh, code, data, and BSS. BSS is just uh, memory that you want to reserve and uh, which does not uh, contain code nor even data. And we want this to be put in chipnum. So that's uh, how it looks and we need to name this section. Uh, we call that tutorial data due to lack of imagination and uh, we assemble that and we get an error right away. We want to um, fill this carpal list with addresses corresponding, pointing to um, partly the sprite, the smiley sprite, and partly the null sprite in order to stop the sprite DMA from ro rolling crap sprites up and down our screen. So previously we've done that by putting the, the address in directly. However, now the address to the sprite is in a completely different hunk, could be in a different memory type, and it this address will not be resolved until the program is loaded by the operating system. The operating system will change this uh, this label down here, um, this one, and uh, no, this address. Uh, the system will change this address to wherever it loaded this this data hunk. That means the assembler does not know the correct address of it yet. It did when we put it at an absolute address. So let's go ahead and fix that. Uh, we'll put a temporary address of zero in here that we will later replace. And uh, we'll do the same with the other. Uh, the other, I'll do like this like real quick. And the reason I'm doing this is because control delete does not work in Win UAE with my keyboard for some reason. This is a special keyboard and you will probably be able to just press control delete here. I'm pressing enter and control D instead. Okay, so, so that's clear. Let's see if it uh, assembles. It does. We can check the address of um, where the data is located. So we'll check the address of init. Where is that in memory? It ended up in fast memory somewhere. And, um, and we don't know uh, what's loaded into the memory. So the actual address that it's loaded to means nothing for, for the code part. However, for the graphics, the graphics uh, hunk starts with a sprite. And uh, that's relevant um, because we need, we sort of need to, to plan ahead and make sure the chip mem memory doesn't get full or anything. So, but anyway, it's loaded very low down in memory, probably in some small available little chunk of memory uh, just after, just between the system buffers and the uh, CLI screen buffer. Uh, so we don't need to worry about that because the assembler has um, reserved the memory for us instead of just assuming that it's available and and putting it there, uh, po potentially overriding system memory. We don't need to worry about that right now because uh, the assembler with this section statement has made sure that that. Um, the memory for, for the data and code is reserved in a, an OS-friendly way. And we're in no danger of overriding anything. But we need still, we still need to set the uh, sprite pointers. And we do that the same way we did the, um, we set the logo pointers, or indeed the, well, we do it that way. Um, so in the hardware in it here, we need to copy some code. Um, and actually we can use this simple code. 
since we only have we don't really have a lot of bit planes that we don't need to increment increment a graphics pointer address we, we just just need to set two fixed addresses the correct way so we can copy this um, single bit plane pointer poker um, and change it so let's do that um, we know that the um, sprite is located at this address and we may have to do something about this later on load effective address of the sprite to a0 and uh, we need to poke that somewhere namely to the sprite pointer area of the copper and that was down here let's have a look it consists of two words the custom chip address and the high word of the pointer another custom chip address and the low word of the pointer and that's it basically so let's poke th all these addresses and we can just move them together now these are all the eight sprite pointers that we have available so we need to set this first one these two words to uh, our smiley sprite and the the other seven to point to the null sprite that we defined our, in the previous lesson so let's go where we were and um, this is correct for the first sprite it will put the um, address of the, of the sprite into d1 swap down the high word of the address put that word at offset 2 in, uh, to the pointer into the copper poke it at offset 2 and swap it again and poke the low address at offset 6 so the easy way to do this now then is to copy this again and make a little loop or if you're lazy you can use the the REPT statement but well that's um, you can explore this on on your own so um, we will not set the a1 register we will instead increment it and we can do this by in several ways we can add l number 8 comma a1 that's the slow version you could add since it's 8 or less since it's uh, between 1 and 8 I should say uh, you could use add quick and use the word size or long word size it doesn't matter on any uh, 68,000 family CPU uh, if you want to use the the word uh, the long word size go ahead or the word size it all ends up being an, uh, a long word add as uh, as soon as you load uh, any modify any type of of address register using a word size instruction the whole long word gets set always always so you could do it this way this is the preferred way you could also use the addressing modes like this uh, so there are many ways to do this I'll just um, use this um, now this is the wrong address for each we will make this into a loop that will loop seven times and each time we want to set the address pointer to null sprite actually we only need to do this once because the d1 register will be preserved later on so let's move the increment instruction into the loop and put a loop here um, I will do it like this because I'm used to it um, and we'll use a uh, local label we'll call it sprite pointer loop always use dbf never dbra um, it's a misnomer it's a duplicate instruction but um, it's, it's logical it's it's a decrease in branch if false is the 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 um, correct way to type the loop instruction if you think dbra is easier to read then by all means go ahead and use it 
So that's our poke loop, and we'll simply check if we get rolling sprites after we write it as tutorial 12. The undefined symbol, we forgot the dot. The dot is what makes it a local label. That means that it doesn't consume f um, a few bytes of memory when assembling. It's simply a, a local uh, label that will be similar to local variable. It will be forgotten in the next section of code, which is whenever you get a normal label, whenever you declare a normal label like this. So let's go ahead and check that. Well, it look now. You, now we have crap because we've done something to the memory. We've uh, let the system allocate some memory, and there's some crap after the logo, after this um, data hunk that we allocated, or that the operating system allocated, I should say. So we got the crap back. So I can show you how to remo remove it now. Uh, but first, we need to s see that our smiley sprite works and moves as it should. If you remember the last time, let's check that again, uh, the last time we moved down the logo on the copper bar uh, a few centimeters on the screen to make it um, not flush to the top of the screen. It looked better, according to me. Um, and uh, this means that above the logo the, uh, the, the um, bit planes are turned off. Uh, because we changed the display window, if I recall correctly. And that means if the display window is turned off, you need to use a little trick, namely to uh, poke the bit plane data register uh, using the copper or the CPU uh, to trigger the um, sprite DMA uh, looking, at, looking for a control word to display a sprite. That's a trick that you can learn later on. Right now, I don't want the sprite up there. Instead, I want it uh, somewhere above the uh, the play field or the bitmap, random bitmap data that we uh, that we created in the last lesson. So I'll go ahead and do that. And so I'll just move it down, and we do that by modif modifying the um, sprite control words. Right now, it's very high up on the screen. Let's move that down to an easy position. And there's our little smiley sprites. It looks quite horrible, I must say, these colors. So how about we uh, see if we can um, make it look a little nicer, perhaps. And there's a temptation to make the lips red, but I have no idea how to make this Smiley sprite look good, I'll be honest with you. I would say that if I um, make the uh, eyes black and the mouth dark gray, perhaps, and the face itself yellow, some sort of yellow, it'll look a little better if I keep the saturation down on the RGB values. So I'll just uh, look for the uh, color 17 register um, and um, modify this. I'll have to, this is the red color which was uh, the, the face color. So to make that yellow you do it like this, however we want less saturation so we modify it like this perhaps or even that much. Let's just check it. Oop, I was wrong. This is yellow. Well, it's sort of, kind of, so looks a little bit bleached to me. Well, we'll check how it looks later on. And uh, the mouth was white, so I'll change that to something like That's a semi-yellow dark gray. We should move the smile down a bit, I think, also. Uh, but it may be overkill, so I'll make these uh, eyes black. Check it. Well, sort of. Maybe we could make it orange. Orangish. 
That's more like dark brown, but you should always do this in Deluxe Paint. Just draw a mock-up and and pick the RGB values from the palette. I have no idea if that looks good or not. Uh, so anyway, um, let's say that's that that's finished now. No, it's not. Like that. Uh, and we have we have a working sprite poking loop in the hardware in it. And let's go ahead and remove the crap. I'm gonna beat the crap out of that logo. Uh, let's have a think about that. We have uh, we have the moving copper bar there, and as you can see, it it goes a little bit below the logo, and that means. Uh, let's see. We have that. We have this. Here's our weight for displaying the uh, ran semi-random bitmap data. Turns on one bit plane and so forth. And these values will will change because the CPU is, is poking them. When the copper bar is moving up and down, these will go from something like hex 40, I guess, down to hex. 94 down here for the lowest uh, color line on the copper bar and that means that we can't insert a weight in here somewhere that turns off the bit planes so the system keeps on displaying three bit planes uh, and of course the um, Denise has already finished reading the logo graphics data and goes into unknown territory in the uh, operating system memory um, that's uh, that's uh, still free uh, unallocated after the the logo uh, graphics data and whatever's there gets displayed so how do we do that this well since we can't insert a, a weight here with a copper because the weight will then some weight will then be lower than that weight. We want to put the weight at hex 90. And these values can be uh, hex 94. So that means the copper list will get broken. We'll first wait for line hex 94 and then try to wait for line hex 90. And that will not work and the rest of the copper list will then not be, not be displayed depending on the position of the of the copper bar. Um, we can simply check this. We'll save this in case it goes bananas, and as, as, as you can see, that's the reason for the for the uh, data bumping like that. Um, and it still displays one line, so we would like to have the weight at eight F instead. And this simply moves the bit plane data down because the copper instructions that set the bit plane pointers doesn't get executed until after the lower weight from the copper bar if that makes sense and as it does so it reveals uh, crap in memory because the bit plane pointer has not been reset either so that's the expl explanation for that sorry for the uh, rant um so how do we solve this we will not look at uh, the advanced solution right now. Hang on. I will instead show you the cheap ass solution, which is to reserve and clear a bit more memory uh, below the logo by setting all the uh, pixels to color zero below the logo for six more lines. We can uh, we can ignore this this error. That's the it's the fastest way to solve the problem, and it's just confusing to show you filtered uh, filtered weights and so on in the copper. So uh, how do we do this? Well, we have this constant logo byte width, and that's the width in bytes of three interleaved bit planes for one line of the logo. The logo height is 67, so it's the total size of the logo graphic uh, divided by 67. And we put this, we simply reserve memory. How do we do this? Well, there's there are two statements, BLK and DCB. They 
both declare a block. Uh, I prefer BLK, but I'll be a good boy and use uh, DCB, which is not the same as DC point B, which just reserves one byte. Uh, you can reserve bytes words or long words. We'll res be reserving um, bytes since the logo byte width is in bytes. Uh, and we will reserve six times the logo byte width to get, get rid of the crap. And we will need to move down the weight as well. Well, previously it moved down the bitmap, it showed crap. But now it moves down the bitmap and shows no crap. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, we can we can let the bitmap data start a little bit lower. Um, uh, that's the horizontal position that was changed to OF for some reason. Uh, nothing to do with you. And uh, let's move it down 16 pixels and see how that looks. Well, we can move it down 16 pixels because we haven't reserved uh, more than six lines of zeros beneath the logo. So let's put it back where it was, like this. Okay, all is good. Nothing, mo nothing wrong with the picture right now, except we have some ugly data. Well, kind of looks like mountain ranges with patterns in them. I thought I'd um, show you the um, some bitmap manipulations, but we're not done cleaning up the source yet. So where were we? Uh, here's another thing. We have a screen buffer right here. Uh, are we using that for the bit plane data? I think we used that, didn't we? Yeah. So we need to remove that and we need to reserve memory for screen. How much should we reserve? Well, this much. This many bytes, I should say. So, go to the bottom and put the screen here instead and use our infamous dcb.b if you can spell it better than I can. Um, and let's remember the bit plane size there. BPL size, comma zero, and <coughs> I should explain that the second parameter is what you want to fill it with, which defaults to zero, apparently. Um, you can also set this when you declare so-called BSS data, which is just uh, a space of memory that's reserved but not filled with any, any values. Then in some ASM1 versions there is an option to clear the newly reserved memory. I don't think this old version has it. Yours may. So anyway, go look for that if you want to set the default. Uh, I recommend to have it off, actually, because otherwise you could get a demo that works perfectly in your assembler, and when you write an object, uh, the reserved memory will have crap in it, and the demo might not work or look bad or whatever. So anyway, we've reserved uh, this many bytes and filled it with zeros. And we should not have to do anything else in order for this to work. Uh, the loop that we had, the CPU loop that filled the bitmap, should now be poking in some other address than hex 60,000, namely this address, some random address of, of memory reserved for the screen. Okay, so um, when we do this, we essentially put append bunch of zeros to the uh, executable, with m which makes it quite big. Uh, so if you test write it as an object, you see that it becomes 16k. And um, there's a way around that, and that's to use a, a BSS area, and then clear, clear the sc screen or bit plane with uh, zero zeros, or fill it with data as we do um, upon initialization of the demo. And that means uh, adding another section that should go in chip memory. We called it we call it this. And it goes it's a BSS chunk, BSS hunk I should say, that goes to chip mem. And we need to change this instruction to not declare a block but declare space. 
and not fill it with anything. And this should lower the object size to 6k instead. So we just saved 10k in the object file. Uh, which will make it better when we when we uh, crunch it and release it later on. So this has made our demo a nice and system friendly object file. Uh, we reserve some memory for the screen but we do not fill it until we get to the init here where we have a uh, loop that fills the bit plane with clock registered data which is semi-random and we'll have a look at um, replacing this and looking how you can manipulate the bit plane after we can we've continued cleaning up the source and there are a few small things needed to make it look a little bit better so uh, let's do that um, let's check how it looks first and uh, we can replace the value in this loop with the number zero and see that it's it's clearing uh, the screen properly so let's clean up the rest of the source here we load the exec base open a library save with the, the original copper pointer um, and restore it uh, when we exit the demo and here we close the library being good boys so that's system friendly here we have some initialization values which and uh, we save away some values uh, in data registers which is um, a bit crappy I, I would say um, we want to be able to use these registers freely because right now whatever we use in the main loop we'll have to preserve these registers and that's not very good programming and also we want to put these in memory somewhere instead of having to to uh, preserve d5 and d3 until the exit of the demo we want to be able to use all the registers in the machine so how do we do this uh, well uh, I, there are various ways we could save them to uh, uh, some uh, address in memory and restore it. We could push them to onto the stack, which leads us to a new topic that I will explain now. Um, I.e., do it like this. Um, or, uh, well, there are. There's a lot of need to clean this source up. Uh, I, 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 w I would not be happy with a program that looks like this. I will refrain myself. I will uh, just do the necessary bits to, to make it a little bit more usable and, 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 uh, and editable in the future. I will just make a few changes to make, it, uh, make the source look a, a bit better. Um, also, we would like to do some more things here to to um, make it even more system friendly. This is the bare bones uh, uh, system uh, startup for a demo, um, but we will get into that later. It's a bit early still for that. So, what do we need to do? We need to make sure we can use all the registers we want, both in the hardware init and in the main loop primarily the the main loop and we want to divide this up into uh, more manageable chunks of code and here's where the stack comes in we've already used it we've used it here when we called a subroutine called wait raster and um, what it does is it pushes uh, the previous program counter which is the address um, the processor was on when it encountered the branch to subroutine statement then it will jump to here and then will it will encounter an art return from subroutine uh, instruction that will let it uh, that will pop uh, the uh, previous program counter address from the stack and and so return to wherever we were um, so it 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 simply the stack is a um, 
simply a pointer which all CPUs are coupled to a fixed address register in the case of Motorola 68000 family series CPUs it's address reg register 7 A7 so SP and A7 are synonyms they're the, they're, they are the same thing you can type either one and it's up to you to use either A7 or SP I always use SP when I uh, because it's easy to read, it reads out as, as SP stack pointer. And this pointer, when you push stuff on all computers, uh, it makes the stack grow downwards in memory. So the stack is very high in memory and grows downward. Um, and you will just uh, count on the operating system to have reserved enough memory to push all the values you should ever want in your program. The default stack, value, stack size is 4K. Um, though you can increase this um, if you want. So we can keep these registers set as they are and save all the registers, uh, treat the um, init hardware init and the main loop as subroutines called from here and these subroutines will be good boys and save away all the address uh, all the data and address registers and restore them on exit now it only needs to save and restore the registers that it actually uses but a common thing to do is to push all the registers on onto the stack and and pop all of them on exit so that you don't have to worry about uh, if you use another data register then you have to add it to the push instruction on the push, push instruction I will show you as soon as I've cut out the hardware in it and made it uh, a subroutine so our hardware in it after we've uh, taken over the system here consists of some screen filling and some pointer poking and various stuff uh, and I'm happy with cutting that out, Control X, and moving it down into routines here. And I will put it at the top where I think it belongs, and we will call this subroutine hardware init. Just like that, just like it was called before. And uh, here we will use this push command, which moves multiple registers, the whole registers. Uh, D0 through A6 to the stack, making it grow downwards like that. That's the push instruction. You can make a macro for that if you want. Uh, I will not get into macros until later. Um, and at the end, we want to pop it from the stack, and the pop instruction looks very similar, although it reads from this, and this is uh, like um, an ef uh, effective ad addressing mode that we've used before. It's a normal addressing mode. It's just uh, this SP is just an alias for A7, and we want want to make sure that we restore the exact same registers that we uh, saved. After this, we want to return from subroutine, and since we cut out our source here. We need to remember where to insert the branch to subroutine statement. Right there. So now, as you can see, our startup code is starting to look a little bit more like a uh, proper, proper initialization routine. Um, and whatever register we use in hardware init is not our concern. It will continue to here. Now, depending on who, how pure you are, you, you can keep the main loop in line like this. I will show you how to make it a subroutine. And we do it the same. Same thing, cut out the appropriate amount of code down to the branch, back to the main loop. Cut it out, move it to the routines, and I think I will put it at the top. It will stay at the top. And we need an RTS, and we need a pop. And we need a... Ooh, hang on. 
Now we have to think a little bit. Uh, we'll call this. Actually, we'll call this main because we are reusing this main loop. That that's a loop pointer. We we don't want that as a subroutine pointer because we want to push the registers registers outside the loop, just as we pop them after the branch back to main loop. So do that like this. Um, I have a I have a quick key for this, so it's very unusual for me to type this. Uh, so anyway, that's our main loop. We can, if we want, do further in initializations here, but we'll refrain f in future, I mean. And uh, here is the pop instruction and the exit outside the main loop. Um, And we will need to change this to main, very important, um, to make sure that we execute the push instruction. We can remove these and make the put them here instead. To make it not very pretty, but a little more, a little more easy to read, perhaps. So we've got our init which shuts down the system. We do our own little hardware in it, which is now sort of a misnomer. It uh, doesn't set up that many hardware registers. It just pokes a copper list and so on. So we can go ahead and rename that to init. And what's missing is an, an exit subroutine, which, as you can see, consists of nothing, basically, uh, and then a uh, turning the system on again. So you can subdivide this further, you can put this uh, this um, initialization in a proper hardware init subroutine, if you wish, but beware that, that you sh when you use the stack you must Make sure that whatever you, these uh, jumps to the operating system also push things on the stack so that you must clean up before you pop from the stack again. So I think it's better to have it in line like this. And now we have a conflict because this is also called init. We'll rename that to start instead, being the imaginative boys that we are. And we'll call this... Um, OS on and um, we'll make a neat little label there just for future reference in case we want to do something here I don't know what but um, we should also be good boys and save and restore all registers for our whole program now that we are starting to make object files we want to make sure that whatever registers were set at the start of our program uh, should be set to the same values on exit. So we can just copy this push instruction and uh, copy the um, pop instruction. And we can add a little comment here, return to the EOS. Now there is a return parameter for all command line programs and all executables. If D0 is set to a non-zero value then it will display a, um, a an error message with this uh, error code in it. You may have seen it from various uh, programs and commands that you've run so that if we think that everything is okay then we should clear d0 and that's basically it we need to clear it after we pop d0 if we put it here then of course d0 will could be replaced with a non-zero value and we don't want to do that we want to tell the operating operating system that everything is okay the, the command ended peacefully um, and 
that means of course that you can optimize a little bit you can save four bytes of the stack by changing that to d1 but you must then also remember to change it on the init here so let's go ahead and, and uh, save this and test it well that's not very interesting is it So let's have a look at this. Goes to here, turns off the system, goes to our little uh, screen initialization, sets the copper branches to the subroutine called main, and exits only when we press the left mouse button, after which it turns the system on again, and should exit the program, but it simply exits the program. Let's see what it does by using the debugger. Well, we can't wait for that, so we'll run this loop. Actually, we'll run the whole init here. And, ah, okay, so that's our problem. Um, as you could see there, if we debug it again, it runs directly to the init and that's because we renamed the label so that was an easy one to fix we set the jump pointer to, to init which is not correct then it will just run the init subroutine like this save all the registers do the init and uh, restore the registers and exit the program so then this beca became the whole program now the structure is like this it jumps to start turns the operating system off, opens some libraries, branches to weight raster, branches to uh, init, returns to here, jumps into the main, which has a main loop in it that exits on a uh, left mouse button press and returns to the BSR main, which is here, continues and turns on the system again. So that's our structure now we can debug this and trace what it does I'll show you that real quick um, it runs the operating system gets the operating system values it branches into this subroutine and waits for a certain raster line and this will not be true until it matches so we set a breakpoint and run it to there Omega R after the RTS, it returns to the main program, uh, sets our values, and that's when the debugger ends. So I can't show you anymore. So I'll reset real quick. So. And here's where we were. So that means that when you are debugging, you cannot turn the operating system off, or at least you can't turn off the the keyboard interrupts, etc. That keeps the de debugger going. So we can debug up until this point, but not until this instruction is is is, is run. So um, I hope that showed you a little bit how it jumps in and out of the subroutines. So all that remains now is to test whether it works or not. It does not because I didn't save uh, the source that fixed the problem the previous run. So that seems to work. Now let's have an, a look, see if we can improve something else. Well, certainly the code could look cleaner. Well, we could uh, replace the weight rasters in the main loop with uh, branches to this subroutine. So we'll copy that uh, that call that we had here and use it in the main loop because we have some ugly inline uh, weight raster code here. So we, we replace this and what we want to do is wait for rest line uh, O2A. 0 to A. 
and we can remove this, saving a bit of code. And that's a reason to use subroutines for things you do repeatedly and to make structure in your program. Uh, we have not. We have only changed the structure right now. We have not. Well, what we did to make sure that we could use um, any register. Now that we have the push and pop instructions in the main here, we can use any of these D D0 through A6 registers inside here, uh, and that's an improvement from from before. So let's see if we. Um <coughs> We have something here, wait class one. Well, no, that seems okay. So let's check if it runs, and if so, then I'm happy as a camper. So we can do some small bit plane manipulation. What if we now we have our main program in main so that Harder to search for. Um, we need we need to go into the init code to see how we fill the screen, and uh, we could make this some sort of dynamic loop. Easily enough, if I change this to the number one, we will get a bit combination of zero 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 one in each byte in the screen. Um, we can make this a binary mask and put a pattern in like this. We can increase the spacing between the bits in the bit plane like this. And we could make it dynamic by making it a register. We could start at zero and increase by one on each loop increment. And clear it up here. And this will show you the CPU counting from zero and upwards. Hang on. Uh, you don't need to use word size there. Uh, we clear it, we move it, we increase it. So why did that look wrong to me? Either way, these bit patterns here represent this counter incrementing. However, for some reason, it counts from 0 to 255. So that means the pattern should repeat every 255th, 256 bytes. But really, well, I'm fooling myself a little bit here. Uh, if you look at the very first um, scan line of the bit plane, you can see that on the in the top left corner here, it's empty. It's an empty byte. Then it's increased by one, which makes uh, the first um, the first pixel in the um, left part of the first bit plane line. Then it increases by one again, which makes puts a two there, and that's just a one shifted up one place, so it's still just one pixel set. Then it cr increases by one again, which makes the value three, and right, sure enough, it sets two bits in the bit plane, because three is two bits combined here. So that's how you know how to fill the bit plane with the correct data. You can do it with a blitter, you can do it with the... Um, I should say you should... you could fill it with the blitter, you could fill it with the CPU, you can uh, scroll things with the CPU or the blitter, um, you can make transforms, uh, that is uh, over which scrolling is is one form of transform. Uh, you can draw lines with a blitter, you can draw lines with a CPU. Anything you can do with the blitter, you can do with the CPU. 
only most of the time it's slower to do it with the CPU on a 68,000 machine. So that's it for now. I hope this showed how to manipulate the bit, the bit planes a little bit. I can demonstrate the, how bytes, words, and long words are stored in memory since that um, might be new to those who come from PC and have actually stored bytes, words, and long words in memory manually rather than using variables and so on. On the PC, it, as you increase the size, um, the lowest byte of the value in a byte word or long word stays at the same address. On the Motorola CPU, it's shifted to the right so that the most significant byte is of a byte word or long word is always at the address you're pointing to. So that means when you store a long word here, you will space them out four times as much and uh, the first bit, the whole uh, byte value that we're adding up will remain in the rightmost byte in memory. So that's how this works and of course you can change this to word size. And if we also change the counter to word size, it will go beyond uh, an 8 pixels wide column of, of uh, increasing numeric values, but only slightly. And so that's how that works. So this is a... Uh, these are counter values increasing, setting more and more bits in their respective columns, and each column is spaced out by 16 pixels because a word is 16 bits. If we change that we keep the 16-bit counter value and increase the... Oh, and we have a bug here, which I'll look into. Seems to overwrite the um, screen memory of... So... <laughs> ah, okay. When we change this, we have to divide this size by 4, of course. And I have no way of, of restoring this bitmap right now because so it will look a little bit crappy, but at least, as you can see, the, the part of the screen that ASM1 clears remains uh, intact. So that's something to be aware about. When you increase uh, this, then for each increment, uh, the address 1 register will be increased by 4. We change the word size we need to divide by 2 to make the correct, to decrease the n number of repetitions so it doesn't go outside our screen buffer and writes into ASM1's screen buffer. So that's it. In the next tutorial we'll go on with bitmap manipulation and uh, take a look at the blitter uh, and use that to make an effect in this bitplane. Thanks for watching. This is Photon signing off. Bye bye.